Okay, uh, I want to address a question that probably many of you have already thought about. When you teach critical phenomena, you always have in mind, I'm, am I sure that the critical exponents are the same on the two sides of the transition? Uh, so this work has been done in collaboration with Frédéric Leonard, PhD student, and it's already published. Uh, a bit of history. So the first thing you notice when you tackle with this problem is that before the 70s, in, in books or in reviews, people were very cautious about defining critical exponents that, what, that were not necessarily the same on the two sides of the transition. While starting from the 70s, the distinction started to disappear. And it's because the renormalization group arrived. And I shall try to summarize the arguments that were given to uh, explain why the critical exponent should be necessarily the same on the two sides of a second order phase transition. <coughs> I have some difficulty actually to explain this because I know that it's wrong. But OK, I'll do my best to, to explain what people have in mind. So the first thing is, I think, a, a theorem that goes back to Kalman who uh, proves that if a theory is renormalizable in the symmetric phase, then it is also in the spontaneously broken phase. This was actually important for gauge theories. Um, then the, the renormalization goes almost along the same way in the two phases. Then you see the difficulty is that when there is a phase transition, Let's think at the Ising model, for instance. So you have the temperature. You have the critical temperature here. And when you lower the temperature, you hit the critical temperature where there is a singularity. And of course, it's difficult to say anything when you cross a singularity. But of course, if you add a magnetic field in this direction, you can draw a pass, a continuous pass, that avoids the singularity. And along this path, everything is smooth and continuous. Uh, the next argument was that the scaling functions that you can write, OK, they are the same all along this path. So the renormalization goes the same way. The paths avoid the singularity. Everything looks continuous. And so the critical exponents are the same. You can even prove, find a proof in the literature, look for instance at Zin Justin's book, that it's true for the ON model, the critical exponents are the same on the two sides of a phase transition. But actually, David Nelson, back in the in 76, which means exactly 40 years ago, had an argument saying that this is wrong. And uh, he claimed that when there are discrete symmetries, I'll actually explain in detail what it means in the following. Then, for instance, the susceptibility. The susceptibility is the response of the order parameter to a change of the external field. So think at uh, the Ising model again. Actually, it will not, not, I shall not consider the Ising model for the following, but OK, for the definition of the susceptibility is the derivative of the magnetization with respect to the magnetic field. And then it says that the susceptibility in both phases will diverge at the transition, but not with the same exponents. But he made a calculation in the O2 model with discrete anisotropies where he showed this. Actually, when I started to work on this, what I wanted to prove was that David Nelson was wrong. But David Nelson is David Nelson. So it's right. OK, since then, there has been a tremendous amount of work on, on this problem. And the, mostly what I shall consider in the following is XY system with O2 symmetry. So think at a magnetic system, two component uh, for the order parameter, a symmetry that in the absence of Anisotropies would be O2, 
And you, for instance, consider what is called the cubic anisotropy, meaning that the spin has some preferred directions here. You can also consider, for instance, the hexagonal anisotropies, and these two anisotropies are indeed realized in real materials, okay, where uh, you have an hexagonal anisotropy, okay, and you have six direction in which the six preferred direction. So there has been a gigantic amount of work on this kind of system, either when you uh, force the spin to to point only in this four direction or six direction, and these, these systems go under the name of clock models, or simply the spin can move in all direction, but there are preferred directions. So you can fin think at a Mexican hat, in which the valley is not flat, but it is modulated. Okay. Uh, so there has been a lot, a lot of work in two dimension and in three dimension. The clock models, for instance, in two dimension, there are many exact results about them. And in three dimension, they have also been uh, enormously uh, studied. And there has been a revival of interest for this system these last 15 years. For instance, because of Pirroc law, deconfined quantum critical points, and also the possibility that maybe in these systems, there are two different uh, phase transition, which actually has been rigorously proven in two dimensions. And so people wondered whether it could also be the case in three dimensions. And the reason was that numerically, people found that in the low temperature phase, there is not one correlation length, but two correlation lengths, two different correlation lengths, that diverge with two different critical exponents. Okay, and I must say that actually there are three people who understood completely independently of uh, David Nelson. Oh, by the way, the paper by David Nelson, it has about 70 citations. I read the 70. And there is not a single one who just say anything about the fact that the critical exponents are different on the two sides of the phase transition. So they cite the, pe the, the paper for something else that is called dangerously irrelevant operators. I shall speak about this in a moment. But not a single one just take care, pay attention to the fact, to this very striking fact, that the critical exponents can be different. Okay, and actually, these three people, Carmona, Periceto, and Vicari, in 2000, they make a calculation. In the case of cubic anisotropy, because they have made a six-loop calculation of some exponent, and they say, ah, okay, look, what we have done strongly suggests that the critical exponent gamma for the susceptibility can be different in the two phases. Unfortunately, precisely for this case, the difference is so small that it is unobservable. And I shall explain why in the following. But, okay, they, they probably understood the whole thing. Let me present the argument under the form of a paradox. Let's imagine that you have an n-component thing, what, what I shall have in mind most of the time is n equal to 2, but the argument is completely general. We could even think at different groups, not on ON. This is completely general. But for the sake of definiteness, let's consider the ON model, to which you add a term, which here as breaks explicitly the ON symmetry, because, for instance, either it has a term that is a cubic term, or by the way, this corresponds in the Hamiltonian, in this case, tau is uh, nothing but the sum between i and n of phi i to the 4. Okay, this obviously breaks the O-N symmetry. It is of degree 4 because the anisotropy is fourfold. This, this one would be of order 6. In this case, tau is phi 1 minus phi 2 square, phi 1 square plus 4, phi 1 phi 2 plus phi 2 square square. It is of degree 6. And, and a, a Q fold anisotropy corresponds to a tau of degree Q in the field. And this tau has two properties. First of all, it is invariant under a discrete subgroup of O n. 
And second thing, it is irrelevant at the fixed point describing the phase transition. This is obvious for this term, which being over the six, is, not, is irrelevant already from the point of view of power counting. It is also true for, for this one, it's less obvious, because it is over the four, we could think that, it's, uh, that it is relevant, but actually it is not. For the n equal to two case, this term is irrelevant. Not very irrelevant, but irrelevant. But okay, generally speaking, we shall consider tau as a near relevant operator. So the argument goes in the following way. Tau is irrelevant, therefore we can neglect it in the long distance physics. Therefore the attractive fixed point is ON symmetric. Therefore the critical physics is identical to the usual ON critical physics because the critical physics is, is given by the fixed point. Is there anyone who does not agree with this? Oh, there is one, but he already knows. You know that. So you are all wrong. This actually is right and wrong at the same time. Why is it wrong? Because what we think at the low temperature phase, the argument is right in the high temperature phase. It is wrong in the low temperature phase. In the low temperature phase, since we have discrete symmetries, we don't have any Goldstone bosons. Since we don't have any Goldstone bosons, the susceptibility, let's imagine that we are considering the uh, XY system with an anisotropy that is fourfold, sixfold, whatever, okay, uh, anisotropy. In the pure model, which means without uh, uh, anisotropies, we can define two different susceptibilities, the transverse one and the longitudinal one, okay? Here, if we consider this vacuum, then we have a transverse direction and we have a longitudinal direction here. We can define two different susceptibilities. And uh, in the pure model, of course, the transverse susceptibility diverges for all temperature below the, the critical temperature, but also the longitudinal susceptibility diverges, which is less obvious. Uh, because at the mean field level it does, does not diverge, but because of the fluctuation also the longitudinal di uh, susceptibility diverges. So in the pure model without anisotropies, the two susceptibilities are divergent. Even since we do not have any Goldstone boson, this means that the two susceptibilities are finite in the low temperature phase, and they diverge only when T goes to Tc, Tc minus. Okay, but this means that although irrelevant, tau matters for their behavior close to the critical temperature, at least in the low temperature phase. And since it matters, the susceptibility, the exponent for the susceptibility cannot be the same as in the high temperature phase, because in the high temperature phase, obviously tau is irrelevant and it plays no role. So the exponent gamma cannot be the same in the high and the low temperature phase. Tau is said to be a dangerously irrelevant operator for the susceptibilities. This name, dangerously ir irrelevant operator, goes back to Fisher in the 70s who realized this kind of thing, and we all know a dangerously irrelevant operator. It is the fight to four uh, operator of the, the, the usual ON model in dimension larger than four. This is also a dangerously irrelevant operator. This one, this tau, is dangerously irrelevant for the susceptibilities. Okay, let us study this with our preferred tool the NPRG with a simple truncation. Oh, sorry, yeah. With a simple truncation, what we are going to do is the LPA. Here is the LPA prime. I have added a field renormalization. Actually, you can forget it. It will play a small quantitative role, but nothing spectacular, okay? So for most of, of my seminar, I shall forget the ZK. And uh, we shall consider the local potential approximation. The potential here depends on two invariants. Rho, which is the usual O2 invariant. I shall now consider the n equal to two case on the uh, six-fold anisotropy. So rho is the usual O2 invariant. And tau is uh, this guy here uh, that is also written here. OK. On top of the derivative expansion, we shall make a field expansion because we do not need to be functional. 
But surely, since we want to, quant to compute something quantitative in three dimension, the strong coupling uh, uh, regime of the fear in three dimension has to be tackled with, and, and so it will be very convenient to use a non perturbative tool. Okay? So, we turn the crank. Here, what I've done is that I've taken the simplest field truncation where I retain only here kappa, which is the minimum of uh, the potential. If I go back to my expansion here, you see that kappa is the minimum of the potential. I have chosen tau such that at the minimum of the potential, it is equal to zero. So the expansion for tau is performed around zero. For rho, it is performed, uh, performed around the minimum. Actually, I have forgotten to write here that kappa depends on k. And I just keep kappa in my truncation, uk, and this coupling in front of tau, and I just eliminate all the others. Okay, the uh, flow equations, they look uh, here not very pretty, not very ugly. And what we see is that we have two different masses, two different susceptibilities in this system. The, uh, this is the inverse longitudinal susceptibility. This is the inverse transverse susceptibility, the masses of the problem. And we see that the transverse susceptibility that should vanish if there were no anisotropies is proportional to lambda 6. Of course, it is, it is not vanishing because there is a, a, this discrete anisotropy. And the longitudinal one is the usual one, the one that already exists in the O2 model. Okay, here I have chosen the cutoff, the, the leading cutoff. You can forget this anomalous dimension that will not play much role in what follows. Okay, what is the flow? What does it look like? So here is the flow in the plane lambda 6 and u tilde. The tilde means dimensionless. I go to dimensionless quantities to uh, see the fixed point structure of the theory. And uh, uh, what we get is three fixed points, the Gaussian fixed point, of course. The usual, when lambda 6 tilde is equal to zero, this is the usual O2 fixed point in three dimensions. And there is a third fixed point that is sometimes called the Nambu Goldstone fixed point that also exists at lambda 6 is equal to zero. And this is the fixed point that drives the low temperature phase of the pure O2 model. Okay? So here we have the high temperature phase. Here we have a line that goes directly to this point. This is the critical line. And here we have two lines that goes in the low temperature phase. And for instance, if we consider this one, we see that there are five parts in the flow. The first part, we start from an initial condition. It's very fast because lambda 6 decrease is very fast. And we arrive close to the xy fixed point. Then, second part of the flow, the trajectory remains a long time around the xy fixed point because it is a fixed point, so the flow is very slow here. Then it departs and it goes very fast close to this fixed point, so this is the first part of the flow, this transient regime here. The fourth part of the flow is that the flow will remain a long time around the Nambu Goldstone fixed point. And then the fifth part of the flow is when uh, the flow escapes the Nambu Goldstone fixed point. Okay, here we retrieve the five uh, different regimes for the flow. Here it is U tilde. U tilde, I remind you, is the coupling constant in front of the O2 invariant term, which means U tilde rho minus kappa square. And we find here the five regimes. Uh, the first one is a transient regime. We approach the xy fixed point. Here there is a plateau, meaning that the flow is very close to the xy fixed point. Then we escape here, and we go close to the Nambu Goldstone fixed point. The flow remains a long time, which means a plateau around the Nambu Goldstone fixed point, and then finally it departs from, from this fixed point. Okay, what about the uh, susceptibilities? The susceptibilities, well, uh, the, the transverse susceptibility, if there were no discrete anisotropy, would vanish all the time. So it does not vanish because there is a discrete, anisotro a discrete anisotropy. Sorry, it's the yellow one, the yellow curve. And what we see is that it decreases extremely fast. Why does it so? 
because here the first part of the flow is very fast because the operator the, and the, the, the operator tau is irrelevant. So since it is irrelevant, the flow is very fast and goes very fast close to the xy fixed point. We retrieve this feature here. The uh, transverse susceptibility goes down very fast. Then the, trans then the longitudinal susceptibility. The longitudinal susceptibility, even in the pure model, is not uh, the, the inverse one, is not equal to zero. It goes to zero because of Goldstone fluctuations, okay, already in the pure model. So what happens in the model with the anisotropy? So the beginning of the flow is exactly the same as in the pure model, and it's only here that it flattens. Here you see the, this dashed line corresponds to the pure O2 model. This is the real integration of the flow, okay? So this dashed line corresponds to the pure O2 model, and we see that the two flow departs precisely here, and here it flattens and it reaches a finite value. Clearly, we see on this flow that there are indeed two distinct length scale in the problem. One, psi, here, that exists because the flow goes very close to uh, the xy fixed point, and here the, the anisotropy plays absolutely no role. So uh, it will play a role at the end of the flow, but not, not when we are nearby the xy fixed point. The physics is dominated by the xy fixed point. And so uh, here this correlation length is the correlation length in the low temperature phase of the pure auto model. But there is a second correlation length here, and this second correlation length corresponds to this last part of the flow when the system realizes that it is not the pure O2 model and that actually it will not remain forever on the plateau corresponding to the number Goldstone fixed point that it, it escapes. And so this defines the second correlation length that is called psi prime here. Okay? So uh, how is this psi prime defined? Well, this psi prime here I have... Uh, uh, I have, uh, uh, it, it, of course, we can integrate the, uh, the flow equations, but we can, without any integration, understand what is going on. When k is of order of the correlation length of the pure model, okay, we have integrated uh, the uh, non-trivial critical fluctuations, so it means that starting from this scale, the flow goes on and evolves according to trivial dimension. So it means that the minimum of the dimension, full minimum of the potentials that correspond to the spontaneous magnetization does no longer change, which means that the uh, dimension less magnetization, square magnetization, evolve according to its engineering dimension. Okay, so this comes only from the fact that starting from psi minus one, we have integrated all the non-trivial fluctuations. Okay, what is the value of kappa tilde when k is of order psi minus one? Remember, the flow is close to the xy fixed point, so kappa, kappa here, the minimum of the potential, is uh, about its, its xy value. Okay, what about lambda six? Well, we think exactly in the same way. Let's imagine that we have integrated the non-trivial critical fluctuation, the scale of the system is the inverse O2 correlation length psi, and then it evolves according to the engineering dimension of this guy. Now we can go a little bit further. What is the value of this lambda tilde six, uh, uh, lambda tilde six at the scale k equal psi minus one? Well, let's go back to the first he thing here. So we started here, and at scale psi minus one, we are here, and we are ready to escape the xy fixed point. So what is the value of lambda six, uh, lambda tilde six, when we are around here? Well, pretty simple to understand what is going on. Uh, this value is nothing but the initial value of the coupling, the bare one, and the, the flow has evolved very rapidly according to the eigenvalue of the xy fixed point in the direction of lambda six. Okay, uh, let's look at, at the picture here. 
there is clearly an eigenvalue of the flow uh, in the direction of lambda 6. And approximately, lambda 6 has evolved uh, in this direction according to this uh, eigenvalue of the flow that I call lambda 6. Okay, so put together, we obtain these two things. Okay, so what we see here, if we combine these two things, I, re I, I recall here the definition of the transverse susceptibility, the dimension full transverse susceptibility after having integrated all the critical fluctuation, which means at, at scale psi minus one, does no longer evolve. And so its dimensionless counterpart evolves according to its naive dimension. Okay, we could think the same way for the uh, longitudinal uh, susceptibility, and, and this is the result. So I go back to the flow of U tilde. I have written in red the terms that would be absent in the pure O2 model. So here, clearly, this is zero, clearly, this is zero. This one is not zero, but you can convince yourself that for k larger than psi minus one, it will be very small. Actually, we retrieve here that if we are in the pure model, this is equal to zero, this I3 is equal to two, and we find the Nambu Goldstone fixed point by balancing this term, which is negative in three dimension, with this term that is positive in three dimension. It's a square here, yeah, okay? But if we turn on the anisotropy, this term is not equal to zero. We have just seen in the, in the last slide that it evolves according to its naive dimension, starting from the uh, scale psi minus one. And so this term start, the, the M tilde is start to increase, and the two flows will dive, the, the two flows between the pure O2 model and the, uh, uh, the one in the presence of the anisotropy, will uh, differ precisely when this term will be order one. I should compare here the argument of the threshold function with one, that we see here. And so the definition of psi prime minus one the scale at which the flow of the pure model on the anisotropic model start to, to differ uh, is given by uh, this term start to play a role, a different role in the pure model on the anisotropic one, and this is when this is equal to one. So this is the definition of uh, psi prime minus one. This psi prime, this scale, this new correlation length will diverge according to uh, an exponent new prime and the susceptibilities will also diverge according to two uh, non-trivial uh, uh, critical exponents that I call gamma longitudinal and gamma transverse. Playing with the relation, I don't have time to show it, but playing with the uh, relation I've just given uh, before, which means this uh, uh, scaling for the minimum and for lambda six, it is kind of trivial to prove how this uh, new exponents are related to the old one, the old one which means new the exponent for the divergence of the correlation length psi, as well as gamma plus, the divergence of the susceptibility in the high temperature phase. And we see that the difference comes precisely from the fact that we have these irrelevant operators, but dangerously irrelevant, because it is able to change the scaling of, of the model. So indeed, the critical exponents are not the same. There is even a new one, this new prime does not have any counterpart. Uh, and uh, now let's go to the numbers. So what we have done is to compute numbers, we have considered the LPA prime, which means we have uh, uh, a non-trivial field renormalization, we have pushed the expansion up to order 12. <coughs> this is very easy to do. And uh, we have computed this uh, exponent, this uh, exponent corresponding to the irrelevant direction in the direction of the anisotropy for different kind of anisotropy, the cubic one up to the Z12. What we find is that this uh, exponent is tremendously large. It is extremely, it can be extremely, extremely large. And so you see our results are there in red and some results in the literature are, are in black. So here is the result by the group of Leon Balance, Lou and Sunvik. And uh, actually, it works pretty well, but for this exponent. So actually, there was a Japanese group that did not agree with uh, uh, the result by balance, so they redid 
the uh, calculation of new prime uh, last year, and they find these numbers that, that works pretty well with ours. Okay. So now I want to, so it works pretty well, and I hope I have convinced you that there, are, there can be different critical exponents with, with differences that are extremely, extremely large. It's not just the small numbers. And the philosophy is that the, the more irrelevant, the larger the difference between the critical exponent in the two phases. So now let me go to something that looks completely different, but that is completely the same. A problem that comes from the standard model. And this work is done uh, with Nicholas Schaeber. It is the problem of the hierarchy and the fine tuning in the standard model. Okay, for those of you who are not familiar with this question, let me remind you wh what it is. Uh, we consider the standard model, and we imagine that the standard model is nothing but an effective low energy theory of a more fundamental theory. You can say, no, I don't want to hear about this because I know nothing about this superstring or gut theory or whatever you want. Okay, but it's difficult to believe that uh, just a renormalizable theory is nothing but an effective theory. The uh, hierarchy problem is the following remark, that in this case, there must be an ultraviolet scale in the theory, and this ultraviolet scale is certainly large. It's large because the precision test of the standard model does not see anything about this, this scale, which means that it's large. Of course, if you have in mind that it is the Planck scale or the gut scale, then this ratio, this ratio is not large. It is extremely large. Okay, and the problem of the, hier the, the hierarchy or the fine-tuning problem is very much the same as in statistical mechanics where we know that we can produce a, a very large correlation length at the price of fine-tuning a critical tem a temperature close to the critical temperature, for instance. Okay, but this is very unnatural. In statistical mechanics, okay, we can turn the temperature and, and adjust as at will, but the universe is, not, is the universe. We cannot just change the parameters of the universe. There has been many uh, uh, proposals in the literature to avoid this problem. And the question is, can we produce naturally light scalars with something that is much simpler than in this kind of scenario? This is what we have done following exactly the same idea. The idea is that irrelevant operators, the operators that in principle we just do not consider, can exactly, exactly play this role. So we have devised a time model, and it's only a time model up to now, for the, uh, uh, for the boson sector, for, for the scalar sector of the uh, standard model. It is not realistic, I insist on this point. And uh, what we need is to have three Goldstone bosons that will be eaten by the gauge fields. And what we want is to have a naturally light particle. So three Goldstone boson, we break O4 down to O3. This will produce a Goldstone boson. And we add here uh, this kind of anisotropies that I have considered here. OK. Um, so the action is similar to uh, what we have considered above, with the difference that instead of having two, vec two uh, uh, fields, we have two four vectors fields, OK? Because we, have, we are considering an O4 model. We have a problem with this time model. We break the custodial symmetry. That is an important symmetry. Anyway, we can run the flow and see what is going on. And this is my last slide. Here is the result. We consider two kinds of fine tuning. A fine tuning where we tune the temperature uh, at the level of 1% close to the critical temperature or at the level of 10%. 10% is what, not what I should call a fine tuning. Okay? And these are the curves. For instance, let's consider the Z12 anisotropy here, or the Z12 discrete symmetry. So we start here and then we run the flow, and we find that the transverse mole here acquires a mass that is 10 orders of magnitude, around 10 orders of magnitude smaller than uh, the bare mass of the problem. And we have nothing, it's for free. It says because this mass, the mass of the transverse mode, is driven by an irrelevant operator. Remember, the, the exponent I got, the yq I got, is extremely, extremely large. So it means that the, trans, that the mass of the transverse mode goes down extremely rapidly. And this is exactly what we see here. Now, of course, the problem is to build something that is realistic from the point of view of the standard model, and we have some ideas about this, this together with Nicholas Sheva. Thank you very much.